If you're wondering why I decided to do this review, this shot right here should answer that question nicely. That Tron-esque border on the edge of the dial was just so cool looking I had to see it in person. This is the Proteus Diver by James and Muriel, and I believe it went on pre-sale starting June 1st. Now, this is actually the second watch by James and Muriel I've reviewed. The first is called the Timekeeper, and I recently took a look at that. And in that review, I did mention the Proteus, as they had asked me if I wanted to review it. But I never expected to review it quite so soon. Yet shortly after that review, they told me that the prototype I was most interested in was available. And that's this moss green version with the stainless steel dual time bezel. So they immediately sent it over so that I could borrow it for a few weeks. Now bear in mind that this is a prototype and not the final version. So there may be some imperfections here as well as some changes to that final version. Not to mention this one has already seen a little bit of action. Now, since this is the beginning of their campaign, I will be sending this on to another reviewer after I'm done. I'm not sure who's going to get it next, but when I do know, I'll have a link down below. But in the meantime, let's take a closer look at James and Muriel's Proteus. The Proteus's case is 40 millimeters without and 43 millimeters with the crown. You're also looking at a lug to lug of 46. So overall, it's a fairly moderate sized case. It's also fairly thin at 12.3 millimeters, and that's from the case back to the top of the domed sapphire with AR which sticks out just enough to make the whole thing look like a little UFO, especially with that steel bezel. Now, other than that, you have your standard 20 millimeter lug width and 200 meters of water resistance, which does include a signed screw down crown at the three. Now that crown is a bit small and a bit stubby, but even with that, I always had an easy time getting a hold of it, which is all thanks to the rather aggressive angled knurling. The Proteus also has a rather solid feel to it, weighing in at 76 grams with this leather strap. And as far as I know, it does come with a bracelet, but since they didn't send me one, I can't really tell you much about it. The case design is rather minimal. In fact, if you're looking straight at it, you really don't see anything other than the lugs coming out underneath the bezel. The finishing is decent. It has polished sides and a brushed top, which with that steel bezel looks pretty cool as there's a slight contrast in the circular brushing on the bezel to the horizontal brushing on the case. Now, moving to the rear, we have a closed screw down case back with a rather cool etched design on it, as well as all the usual pertinent information. Although I did notice a couple of really cool small touches back here. The design that separates out all that information is actually James and Muriel's logo. And just beyond that, you have six small brushed areas, which mirror the sunken white areas on the dial above it. Back to the front, we have the bezel, and there are two options for the Proteus. A regular 60-minute unidirectional timing bezel, and this 12-hour bidirectional bezel in stainless. The action itself is great, and there's no real backplay here. Plus, I really do appreciate that they made this bidirectional, rather than just stick a stainless insert in the timing bezel. There are currently three colorways available, and as you can tell, this is the moss green version. With a flat finishing, it definitely has more of a military look to it than some of the flashy emerald green washes I've seen elsewhere, which when combined with a steel bezel really gives it even more of a tool watch look. The dial layout is basically divided into three sections. In the middle, you have the main section with the applied indices, which are mostly dots with a triangle at the 12. The indices are pretty tiny, and in some ways rather delicate looking, yet they do look well done in macro, with a very polished finish filled in with white loom paint. And I think that contrasts nicely with the flat green and brushed case, which really is something they do need to help them stand out. As I said, they are rather small. In the same section, you have the brand and logo at the top, as well as the model name and water resistance at the bottom which are all printed on in a very fine text. So fine that it's actually pretty hard to read. And in this case, that's all right, as you don't really want it to distract from the design. Now, personally, I would have liked it if the hands were a little wider, but the polished silver finish on them really helps them stand out against that green backdrop. Now, the hands here do look a little rough and macro with a few scratch marks, as well as there are a few specks of dust on the dial. But as I said, remember this is a prototype. 
Moving beyond the indices, we have the second section, which is where that Tron loom comes from, as they're really cutouts for a sandwich or sunken section of loom, with the occasional small bridge that extends out from every other indicator. And moving just beyond that, we have a rather raised chapter ring in matching green with white minute indicators. The indicators are mostly dashes, except for longer bars at the 12, 3, 6, and 9. Now, the way the watch is designed is that the edge of that domed crystal sits right above that chapter ring. So there's always a bit of distortion going on here, and you never really see that chapter ring clearly. And at certain angles, that crystal even starts to distort the indices although this is a bit of a rare occurrence. One other thing with the crystal is that it does make that raised chapter ring seem rather flat, but by doing so, it makes the dial seem larger than it is, and makes the hand seem smaller in proportion. So ideally, you could fix all of this by going to a flatter crystal and avoiding all that distortion, yet because of how thin the watch is, I'm not really sure they could do that without impacting the hands. So it's just something to think about here. Plus, the dome crystal isn't all bad. Not only does it look really good, but the slight distortion really adds to the loomed effect of that sunken section, distorting and expanding that glow just slightly as it moves around in the dark. As a whole, I do like the design. It's clean, very symmetrical, and flows together nicely. It's something that's a bit different, yet also very familiar, although I do have one issue with the design. And that's whenever I did look at the watch, I often found my eyes tended to wander more than usual. They tended to focus more on the bezel and the sunken areas rather than centering in on the hands. And I think this is one design that could benefit from some additional element, one that could add a crosshair effect to it. At least for me, just to help bring focus to those hands. Anyway, let's move on to the loom. And you've already seen some shots of it, so you know how cool it is but let's really put it to the test. Since I wasn't sure how this was going to perform, I included my two standards in it, and they're on either side of the screen. The Vostok for so-so, and the Seiko Turtle for good, as well as another diver with blue loom to compare. Now, as you can see, it does outlast the Vostok, which is good, but it does seem to fade out just before the Seiko Turtle. So as divers would go, I'd say the loom here is okay-ish. I've definitely seen worse, and I've definitely seen better. But personally, I would like to see it a little bit better here. Although I think it's worth noting that with this design, they are kind of at a disadvantage. Just with those small indices and narrow hands, you only have so much surface area to go around. But they do have that sunken loomed area, and I think that's something they should really capitalize on, just by going as crazy with it as they can. Now, as for the movement, we have Miyota 9039 which is basically a non-date, slightly thinner Miyota 9015. Now, personally, I do like Miyota 9000 series movements. They're high beat and have hacking and hand winding, as well as about a 42 hour power reserve. So they're pretty much everything you want and decently priced compared to Salida and Eta movements. However, there is a downside, and like the 8000 series movements, they're not bi-directional when it comes to winding and they may be a little bit louder than you're used to. The rotor noise does bother some, but personally it never bothered me at all. I never even really notice it unless I'm holding it up to my ear. As I said earlier, the Proteus does come with a bracelet, but since they didn't send me one, I can't really comment on it. But I can say that the leather strap they did send me is pretty good. It doesn't quite match the case the watch comes in, but it's pretty close. It's a 20mm strap that then tapers as it goes down to the signed buckle, and it is quick release as an added bonus. The leather is thick, but still relatively flexible, and when you put it on the watch, as a complete package it's rather comfortable to wear. It has a decent weight to it, but it's not overly heavy, and overall conforms nicely to my 7 inch wrist. Now I can't say about the green timing bezel, but with the steel bi-directional one, the watch has quite a presence. Nothing over the top or flashy, but it is pretty hard to miss on your wrist. So with regard to value, we're looking at a price here of $449. And dive watches with a Miyota 9000 series movement kind of run the gamut. So for comparisons on the high end, you have pretty much anything from NTH, and those are all like $650 to $7. But more directly, you have the EMG Nemo and Zelos's Mako 3, 
and they're right at the same price of $449. Although it's worth pointing out that the Mako doesn't come with a bracelet. Now at this price, I would prefer a little more detail work on the case, not to mention just a lot more loom. But overall, it's pretty good for what you're getting. Now, my time with the Proteus is just about over, but I've really enjoyed getting to know it. It's not often that someone sends me a diver with such a different design that really sets it apart, and James and Muriel deserve a lot of credit for that. These days, microbrands have a real challenge when trying to design a successful diver. The market is just so crowded that you need to have a design that sets it apart, yet still familiar enough that people wouldn't be hesitant to buy one for it being too strange. And here, I think James and Muriel did a good job of finding a nice balance. But let me know what you think about the Proteus Diver down below. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me.